Welcome to Canny Cross Conversations with me, Michelle. And me, Louise, talking all things dogs, running and canny sports. This episode is sponsored by the Get Stronger Run a Faster 5K course. It's great for canny crossers and runners to improve their 5K time and keep up with their dogs. On this episode, we chatted to a behaviourist, Emma Johnston, who raw feeds her own 12 Siberian sled dogs. Um, We chatted about the types of raw feeding because it can be very complicated if you're looking into it and looking to get started. You know, what does DIY mean? What's 80-10-10 and 80-20? There seems to be a lot of jargon around raw feeding. So we talked about that And we had a really interesting chat about how nutrition can actually be at the core of our dog's behaviour. It was fascinating, wasn't it, Louise? Absolutely. And yeah, I I feed pickle kibble. I always have done. Um, And I am going to look into this now um, just because of some of the things that um, she mentioned and behaviour. It'd be interesting to see. Really interesting. Yeah, well, have a listen. Let us know what you think. Um, and do feedback via the Canny Cross Conversations Instagram page. But here's this week's episode. Enjoy. Welcome to this week's Canny Cross Conversations. And this week we have Emma Johnson, who used to be a Canny Crosser, but now race rigs. And we're going to chat to her about raw feeding her sled dogs, which she has done for the last 15 years. So welcome, Emma. Um, please do introduce yourself. Yeah, hi. Thanks um, ever so much for having me on. So as you said, my name's um, Emma Johnston. A little bit about me sort of on a personal level. I won't bore you with it too much because I'm pretty sure you're more interested in my dogs, to be honest. (laughs) Um, But um, in my personal life, um, I'm actually a qualified behaviourist and and have been for the last um, 15 years. Um, and, um, in my even more personal life, um, I breed race and show, um, working Siberian sled dogs. Um, so I currently live with 12, um, yeah, yeah. I bred a little couple of years ago and, uh, decided to, to keep them all. So there was four. So I can tell you my, my gin bill went up by about tenfold during uh during during raising those puppies even though I've done this job for 15 years it almost brought me to my knees raising the four of them are they a popular popular breed um yeah 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 I mean yeah I mean the sled dogs obviously um it kind of tends to go down sort of roots now you've got your, your purebred working um, your pure, well, your, your purebred breed, should I say? And then um, the way that obviously the sport is going now is you've got your Euro hounds and your Graysters and and um, those sorts of breeds of dogs. Of course, any dog can can compete as long as they're healthy too. But um, but yeah, the the, the the Siberian population and the um, Nordic population is 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 still there and um, going strong. I think I've got most of them. But <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Sorry, I certainly I feel like I've got. Most. I interrupted your uh, intro there, so apologies for that. But I was just curious. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. So, yeah, that was that. That's me, really. Is um, I'm uh, 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 I'm, a, I'm a qualified behaviourist. Um, I run the Lost Trail Sled Dog Kennel from um, now up here in Lincoln. I've just relocated from down south about eight months ago. Oh wow! Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, I, as, as you said, I I started off many many moons ago it feels like now in canny cross um i done the typical uh journey into dog sports with oh i've got a dog and i think it needs some exercise and i need some exercise and one went to two and two went to four and <laughs> it's way, doesn't it yeah and um i very much continued from there and as i said now um now i share my life with with um with 12 of them so it's all all good fun at the Lost Trails headquarters. Thanks. Quite impressive. Quite impressive. <laughs> Fantastic. So, so talk, talk to us about raw food. Um, and you, you've been feeding your dogs for 15 years. I am going to hold my hand up here. I know nothing about it. And okay. I feed, feed my dog kibble. What do you do, Michelle? I feed um, Poppy on like a raw complete because I, I, I've read that raw food was better for them, but... 
I wasn't quite sure when I lo- looked into it, it just looked so complex. So really interesting to hear your views on it today, Emma. Um, because yeah, I just buy a, so- the bags of the complete raw, which is easy for me, um, but expensive. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So there's there's kind of a, a few versions to a degree of, of what you will see available when it comes to um, raw food. There's lots of kind of terminologies. And the one thing that I will say that I think us humans are always quite, um, um, I don't want to say good, because it's probably the wrong word, but what we like is we like a box. So we like, yeah. a, we like a, right, so what do you feed? And because if you feed it and my dog's obviously going to do great on it. So we almost like to almost put everything into a box all the time of what works. Do you know what I mean, if somebody's doing well, for example, with a, with a dog, everyone's like, Oh my God, what do you feed? And there's so many sort of factors um, when it comes to feeding. Now, as you said, when you, when you look out um, on the, on the internet or, or have a look around, there's quite, there's a couple of, of versions that you might hear. Um, so DIY for example, is um, do it yourself, which is, um, um, as you were just saying, Michelle, there's there's uh, brands out there which in effect have what they would class as everything in it. Yeah. And then there's people that like to make all the little um, sort of uh, uh, portions up and, and uh, themselves to a degree. Um, one of the other ones is what some people might commonly hear is called 80-10-10. Um, also called um, the prey model that you might hear it said again. There's lots of different terminologies very often for the a, a similar um, a, a similar product. So the eighty ten ten or the prey model is based on eighty um, percent muscle meat, ten percent offal, and ten percent bone. So that's generally what you're what you'll be looking here of eighty ten with the food. Um, and then sometimes what you might hear is uh, 80-20s. So this is um, 80% with meat and bone and 20% veggies. Now, the one thing that I'm always um, try to be very sort of clear on um, when I talk about feeding is just the same as anything. Again, we look for that one cap fits all. We look for that what's the magic sort of formula to a degree. Mm-hmm. And I think what's really important with anything that you look at, and certainly even amongst all of my guys, is individuality. And it's it's more about getting to understand what your dog needs. I've got some dogs, for example, that on um, a certain brand of food, um, their 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 toilet, their, their their stools might be a little bit too firm, for example. But some of my dogs will be fine on it. Yeah. So. This is it's it's exactly the same for anything. Uh, I mean, I love cheese, I love onion. Unfortunately, cheese and onion don't love me that much, um, <laughs> and I, I, I do still eat it <laughs> and then moan about it horrifically the next day <laughs> when I don't feel very well. Does everybody feel like that when they eat cheese and onion? No, absolutely not. Um, it's me. So I think one of the things that we always, although we try to find a, a kind of standard formulization, we always have to be very, very aware. By looking at foods, um, it very much is about what what works for that, I mean, what works for that individual dog. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, why did you choose raw food over kibble then? Yes. Yeah. So, um, oh, right. Do you want to get a cup of tea and sit back for this one? Because it's probably going to be a long answer. (laughs) (laughs) No, but this is the one I'm interested in. (laughs) Yeah. So um, I'll I'll probably, first of all, probably a good place to start is where my raw feeding journey started, if I'm being honest. And it was um, a, a long time ago with one of my first sled dogs. Um, and um, he was kibble fed and um, he really struggled to gain weight and he just really didn't do well on it. And I had quite a few um, people sort of uh, that were that was into Canny Cross because when I sort of started uh, Canny Cross, it was almost when Canny Cross was kind of in its infancy and it was really just finding its feet over here. So, um, yeah, that was kind of how long ago <laughs> I, was do- I was doing it. And so a couple of Canny Cross people um, mentioned raw feeding um I'm vegetarian I would like to say as well oh, wow. <laughs> so, um, so I was a bit oh I'm not too sure I don't know whether whether this works and the story is that I was actually out with um with with my dog at the time his name was Red and um 
he he got hold of a rabbit. It was a dead rabbit, um, unfortunately. And I was wrestling with this dog trying to get this rabbit from him in the middle of a field and there was people walking by and I think it was the embarrassment more than anything and I just went do you know what have the rabbit I'm not going to stand there trying to fight you for this rabbit any longer just eat it and when we got home um I sort of waited for him to go to the toilet and I thought oh good lord alive this is this is going to be okay and I was sort of waiting for for the fallout and um I've got to be honest it was the best it was the best toilet he'd ever had and I went do you know what maybe there's something in this (laughs) (laughs) one way of finding out isn't it so in all honesty my journey into raw feeding um was yeah it was over was over a dead rabbit me wrestling a dead rabbit off of off of my dog is the absolute honest answer it's nothing (laughs) nothing overly flash if I'm being (laughs) if I'm if I'm being fair um but the reason that I kind of continued on um with with the raw feeding is personally um with with my dogs I mean in my as I said in my day job I'm I'm a behaviorist and what I do know without without shadow of a doubt is nutrition plays a massive factor um, on a dog's behavior. Um, do you know what I mean mm. hugely? And so if it's playing a massive factor in a dog's behavior, it is absolutely playing a massive factor uh, in in their body as well. And if it's playing if it's factor within their body, then it's going to be uh, do you know what I mean perfecting a f- performance as well. Yeah. Can I can I just ask a question in there because um, mm. I'm I'm I haven't heard that before about nutrition pain a part in their behaviour and in in what sort of way because I have a very prey driven dog and I feed it kibble with it you know yeah so what what we're learning lots um the the really wonderful thing about um obviously when you when you follow science is that it's changing all the time and we're really trying to learn um a a lot about um dogs and the way they work and and sort of nutrition and, and and all those elements so um what we know at the moment in behavior um is that there's lots and lots and lots of um of organisms within the dog's stomach now the stomach works on an on a on access so there's a there's a nerve that goes through the body which is called the vagus nerve and it is directly connected to the brain and so um they call the stomach um they call the gut the second brain because what okay. starts to happen is uh, I think the best way to kind of describe it in human terms is I know that um before I used to do a, do um races sort of races especially canny cross mm-hmm. races your stomach churns and you I mean you feel nervous and then what it does is it sends signals to your brain and goes oh I'm feeling a bit funny and the brain goes okay I'm going to send signals out to the rest of the body so they consistently work on this um ever turning loop of um of information and one of the things that 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 we do know one of the things that's kind of coming out in studies very much at the moment is when you actually give your dog variety um, good amounts of variety. What the stomach produces is a, uh, is is, m- is more healthy organisms to a degree. So, again, the best way I always like to describe it is children. You keep them sterile, they very end up and being more poorly because they don't build up the resilience to. Uh, do you know I mean a lot of the germs as opposed to kids that are normally out eating worms and doing all the. Do you know what I mean gross things that we generally yeah. tend to see is is not great. The fact is is that that exposure um, builds up that kind of resilience to a degree, and it's very much the same with the gut microbiome. So if you have a, an unhealthy gut microbiome, in effect, what it does is it sends signals to the brain going, "I'm not, I'm not okay, I'm not okay." brain starts to communicate with the rest of the body and go, "Quick, what do we need to do to help you?" And so again, you kind of get on this constant loop of um potentially sort of stresses or anxieties or um uh, do you know I mean even sort of, sort of um stomach damage so you can get things like leaky guts and and um, and all of those things so what we do know at the moment is that variety um is is definitely key the more things that we can generally give our dogs um, to build up those those microbiomes in the stomach for that variety, the healthier the stomach will be, which then in effect has a direct link in with the in with the brain. So they communicate with each other all of the time. And that, I mean, you talk about variety, and I I often think when I give her a food each day, God, this is really boring. <laughs> but so that you know that's really interesting that, and also that it might have an effect on her. Yeah, 
Yeah, I've mean, never thought that before. I don't know really, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, I I always try to. The thing that um again a lot there's been a lot of study done um with regards to um how sort of wild free roaming dogs eat and the the studies that were done um I can't remember the the figures exactly because when I looked at them it was probably about three years ago. Um, but from memory, um, when they actually observed what what wild dogs um, ate, it was up to 44 different varieties of food. Wow. Um, so it was a huge amount, a huge amount that, that I mean, all in obviously different portions, because what we know is that uh, sort of very rarely now do they turn to predation. So dogs have generally become kind of scavengers. So whatever's around in is it would generally be what what they eat so what's chucked out if there's a carcass around um so the variety that they actually have is is huge um and as you quite rightly said louise i i always try to liken it to coming down for breakfast and somebody's made you eat a bix other brands are available uh <laughs> coming out right. i mean uh, <laughs> I mean, I mean, coming coming out and having lunch and having Weetabix and then going to bed and having Weetabix and there's kind of only only sort of so much that, that that you can get from that. If if your dog's consistently getting the same thing day in and day out, we're really in how much gut microbiome they make. And from the studies that have been done, um, that kind of limited access to variety produces less less healthy gut microbiomes to to kind of interact with each other and produce produce a healthy gut. But is kibble? Sorry, Michelle. Is kibble really that bad? I mean, I don't. You, I don't know if you. You know, I know it's your personal choice, but is it? Yeah. Yes, it is. Did you just say? No, no, sorry, I thought Michelle was going to say something. <laughs> sorry, no, 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 it wasn't. Yes, it's yes, it's 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 horrendous. Um, I think there's. I think there's there's kind of good and bad in both the one thing that I don't ever like to do because I think it's personal choice and I think it's what people can afford and I do think it's kind of what people are comfortable with and personally I think that if people are sort of really want to to kibble feed um okay that's fine but let's start to look at what we can add into our dog's bowl for for variety so um do you know I mean can we add sardines in can we add chicken in can we add some fruit and do you know I mean some fruit and veg into the bowl because as you just said that that kind of sort of consistent brown biscuit yeah. doesn't necessarily um do you know I mean give, give that give that variety that's needed um with kibble um a few of the things that i think uh, it is important to make sort of people aware of is how it's labeled can actually be quite misleading at times so very often you will see on the back of packets that it's got 60 percent fresh meat for example um but that was before the kibble was cooked so actually, by the time the kibble is cooked, it might drop down to something like five to ten percent, for example. And this, I'm just plucking these percentage out of the air. Do you know what I mean? As, yeah. as as an example. But what we do know, even with human food, is that when you cook it at high temperatures, really high temperatures, it tends to lose a lot of the naturally bioavailable nutrients. Yeah. What the, from my understanding, as I said, uh, this is this is just sort of what I picked up along the way. That a lot of the uh, companies will then um, spray the kibble with um, vitamins and minerals afterwards to bring them back up to to, to level. Um, and for me personally, again, I feel that for my dogs, um, I would prefer those vitamins and minerals to come from as many natural sources as possible. Um, as opposed to potentially synthetic sources, it says, yes, it might lay, sort of list on the back that you, that this is what's in there, but they may not be bio bioavailable to your dog and your dog's intake because they may not be able to take, for example, the synthetic version of of um, of what's on there. Um, I think what's really important to point out as well, though, is that there, do you know what I mean, there, there's levels of of raw food as well yeah so uh, I think it's really important what I don't want to do is is sit here and demonize anybody's um anybody's choices because I think there's good and I mean there's kind of uh, positives and negatives in I mean in um I know certainly for some um raw food manufacturers where um the food is is 
something potentially cheaper. It might be that the the type of meat um, isn't necessarily the best. I know that sometimes the fats um, in certain foods, um, again, I'm not going to say which one is which, but uh, it, the fat might be from um, restaurants that's left over cooking oil. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, so there's 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 a lot to 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 read into, and and with regards to what things can be labelled as, um, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a minefield um, with regards to what is allowed to be said and what actually is, if that makes sense. So, for me personally, um, the reason that I that I kind of went down the the, the raw versus um, kibble root is I, I love that variety. My my puppies were raised right from mum's milk straight on to raw food I and the thing that, that I question, yeah yeah uh, they, they they had mum's milk um and they went that they went straight on to raw and the thing that I really love um when we talk about the variety in the raw feeding is that um for example when when the puppies were uh, sort of up to say about six months old um they were on four meals a day and those four meals could be four different proteins mm-hmm. so they might have lamb in the morning then rabbit then fish and then do you know what I mean beef later on and eat better than we do <laughs> yeah my dog's definitely eat better than I do I can um, tell you I think, I think I live on beans and toast most of the time whereas my dogs are getting these <laughs> my food bill is extortionately high as I'm sure you can um as I'm sure you can imagine yes, okay. um but the one thing that I that I do always sort of uh, like to point out, if I'm being honest, to uh, certain clients and and anybody even sort of talking in, on on just a, a personal level, is that my one question is with a lot of kibble, if you were to change brands or keep switching it, your dog would very often get an upset stomach from that. So we, we know that we're told to introduce kibbles more gradually and that you need to do it over the space of a few weeks. But with but with raw, I can give four different protein. I mean, four different proteins in a day. And yeah, I've got minimal minimal poo. I'm going to be honest, coming out the other end um, because they take a lot. I mean, they take that that sort of nutrients out of it. So they, they get for me, they get a lot more out of that food because there's a lot less coming through the other end. When people tend to feed the certainly the more sort of cheaper brands of kibble as well that tend to be more fillers. Um, sometimes it looks like I mean that the horse is pooed. If I'm being honest, they're they're massive, and I think you're you're literally paying to put it in one end and, and for it to come through the other. So <laughs> it's um yeah, no, it's not necessarily a, a a nice topic to talk about, but I think it it actually tells you an awful lot when um what you get out is non smelly, small, and do you know what I mean and yeah, I mean, I, I personally, I, I've been on steak outlines where I've been waiting to run and I've almost been knocked out by the do- sort of three steak outs down from the, the smell from going yeah. to the toilet. That'd be Honestly, pickle, then. <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> um, whereas, with, I mean, whereas with, with, with my guys, as I said, it's very small, very minimal. Um, we don't, do you know I mean, we don't get wind. We don't get, do you know I mean, we don't get any of that, which, which for me on a personal level, speaks do you know what I mean speaks volumes well, can um, you imagine it with 12 dogs and they all have wind problems oh dear <laughs> the gas mask or... <laughs> not only that but 12 dogs that that um yeah potentially defecated to that degree oh yeah oh. no thank you you're you're you're, you're all right <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, that, that's the first thing I heard about it that you know that the um sort of the poo is uh is less and, and they're taking more nutrients on but yeah, yeah. And, and the coat di- the coat difference the coat difference uh, do you know what I mean that I've that I've personally um that I've that I've witnessed with my dogs is do you know what I mean phenomenal I, I wouldn't ever personally ever go back uh, do you know what I mean not at all if if I had a dog that didn't want to eat it and that wanted to do you know what I mean that, that genuinely wanted to to be on kibble do you know I mean absolutely fine again we have to look at um do you know what I mean dogs as an individual we also have to look at what people do you know what I mean what people can do and what people can afford mm-hmm. and what people's lifestyles are um the, the really nice thing about the the kind of raw feeding um nowadays is that um there's a lot of companies out there where the standards for how they're processing this food is ridiculously high 
Do you know what I mean, it's it's really, really good. Um, I know that a lot of people sometimes get a backlash from veterinary professions about feeding and about the bacteria, et cetera. But um, again, it's standard hygiene, the same as if you were sort of if you ate raw meat yourself. Wash the dog's bowls up, wash your hands up. Um, and it, in all honesty, uh, I know that there was some years ago um, a salmonella outbreak within um, within kibble. So I think what's also really important to highlight is that there is there is dangers in both. Neither are perfectly safe and neither are per- ridiculously unhealthy um, or, or dangerous. Um, do you know what I mean, kibble isn't, isn't completely safe. And we know that raw food isn't going to be completely safe from sort of germs and, and bacteria if you don't treat it right. Um, but to have this kind of um, one's one's perfectly safe and the other one isn't. I don't think it's fair. I think people should be able to make a choice. Mm -hmm. And I think people should be able to make a choice based on informed decisions rather than scaremongering. And I think that's what I don't like a a, a lot of the time is the scaremongering that that, that goes with it. If people do all of their research and go, do you know what? I really don't think it's for me. Um, I mean, I know somebody who's got dogs that if you put raw meat in their bowl, they'd look at it like, what the heck is that? And they wouldn't know what to do. do I mean, they wouldn't know what to do with it. And you go, okay, that, I mean, again, that's, that's down to that dog's personal choice. So this isn't about sort of demonizing this this is about just making sure that we're having good honest open conversations so that people can actually then make good informed choices about what's right for them and about what's right what's right for their dogs um for me again personally sort of why i've chose kibble overall for for my for my performance dogs um is it's is really quite simple and Again, this is a very personal opinion, um, not anything sort of based on um, anything. But we're feed. I'm feeding athletes. Do you know I mean I'm yeah. feeding strong, working? Do you know what I mean working athletes? And the one thing that I always have in my head is um, I when I started uh, when I was doing canny cross many many moons ago, um, I used to ultra run. So mine were 50, 50 milers that I used to that I used to do quite regularly, and. The one thing that we look at when we look at human athletes is nutrition and what we put in. And I don't think that we would ever go to a doctor and go, I'm an athlete. And they go, eat processed food. <laughs> Definitely the diet for you. Eat processed food. <laughs> no, that's a good point. It's a very good point. Isn't so, it? And like I said, I'm, I'm not, it, I mean, and that's fine if you want to do that. But again, can we add, even if even if potentially there's a bit added in or just something for for, for that sort of variety, mm. it's about add it, do you know I mean adding that variety. But on a personal level, and the way that my mind works when I'm feeding athletic dogs is to feed them fresh, natural ingredients that 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 they are going to get the potentially the most nutrients from because I need them to be at their peak. I need, do you know I mean, I need them to be fit. They are <clears throat> crazy banzai. <clears throat> nutcases when you're trying to hook them up and get them do you know I mean get them running in a team and they probably burn higher energy just trying to get them to the start line and get them hooked up if I'm being honest. <laughs> so I need them to retain as much of that as possible please <laughs> so that when we're out on the trail they um they don't lose performance halfway around. Michelle is that yeah. is the next question yours? What's the next question? about feeding complete raw food and oh yeah yeah because I feed a complete so I mean the thing that confused me most about when I was looking into raw food was Mm. how I like what kind of vegetables and how I add the bone content to the food I mean what does a general day's feeding look like for you for your dogs yeah, so again, it's it's really um, individual to a degree. So the one thing that I'm always quite careful of is I'm not overly fussed, if I'm being honest, about them getting everything in one meal. Yeah. Because we don't generally do that. Um, what I always just try to make sure is that it's quite balanced. So um, when you were talking about the, the completes, um, a lot of people can't class... Um, sort of true completes as your you, you meat with your bone and your fruit and your and your veg and et cetera. Mm-hmm. 
And as I said, you've got your, you've got your 80, 10, 10s. And so for me, I tend to just vary. Some days they'll have um, some completes in with fruit and veg. Some days they won't. Some days they'll have an 80, 10, 10 and ask some actual um, chunks of fruit and veg in because, again, texture and whether they chew it, what, how it feels. I mean, all of that is part of the, the eating experience. Again, um, what I always try to refer back, refer, refer to because of my job is um, even though our dogs are domesticated, they still have these very innate drives, still behave like a, I mean, like a dog. And yeah. so having that variety where it comes in different <laughs> forms and different textures, if they're comfortable with that, I've got one dog, for example, that if you give him um, a cube of liver that's slightly defrosted, he will sit there and look at you with the most filthiest look on his face. Like, what is that? I am not touching that. But if I give it to him frozen, John, yeah. he's he's, ab- he's absolutely fine with it. Um, the four puppies, I call them puppies. They're three this month. <laughs> uh, believe it or not, I can't believe we've survived that long together. Um, they will eat anything. <laughs> There is, there is no fussiness with regards to them. Whatever you put down, you're actually lucky if you get the bowl down before before all of it's before um or before all of it's gone. So, I think again, I think people worry more with a raw diet about getting everything in in one meal. And it, it, it relax, breathe a little bit. It's, it's okay. You, you don't have to be. Do you know I mean, oh my god, I've got to get everything in, in into this bowl. Some days, do you know what I mean. I'll add um, sort of, I mean, um, eggs in. Some days I'll put some other bits in. What I try to do is I try to have a look at what I'm feeding. I always try and keep tabs on what I'm feeding and I always try and, and level it out and, and balance it up. Some days they have fruit and veg, some days they won't. Some days it'll be an 80 10 10. Some days I'll just do, do you know what I mean, um, a, a bit of a DIY together. As long as over that week, it's starting to level itself. You know I mean, it's starting to level itself out, and that's all I that you know I mean, that's all I want to know is that they're getting that good, healthy variety within. You know what I mean, within their meals. So, like you said, you can get your, your completes that have got that that in with them, but you can they can still have that, but in a different. You know what I mean, a different format. Um, one of the the sort of bits of information that's starting to come through now um, that I've that I've kind of been following a little bit is that. Um, sort of your your leafy greens tends to be um, what we're believing to be the best type of veg. So things that grow above ground. Um, so obviously things like kale and I mean all those sorts of things. And if obviously you put that in a bowl and your dog looks at you and goes, "What on earth is that?" Think about how we can change it up. Um, my dogs wouldn't eat it if it was in a bowl. If I'm being unless it was the pups, but I blend it and put it into um, ice cube trays put it in in an ice cube into their bowl and generally um do you know what I mean generally they'll 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 yeah. scarf it down so that's, that's that's sorry that's really interesting because pickle will if I'm growing it kale she'll eat it she'll sure, always yeah. go for it and also when we're in the fields when the cabbage is about you know she she loves that and will go yeah. for it as well but doesn't that make them smelly because that's what I assume it always is when no, no. Everybody always tends, I think we tend to think about human digestion far too <laughs> commonly with <laughs> along with um, along with dog digestion. And the one the one thing that 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 we kind of do know to a degree is that although obviously we've selectively bred our dogs to look at certain ways and we've highlighted traits for for our purpose, uh, internally they're still very you know what I mean exactly the same as what they were when they're free roaming yes. so this is why it's always really important I think to look back at um you know what I mean what do they do originally how do you know what I mean how do we help them be the most natural version of themselves because although we can clearly see that do you know what I mean like I said I've got strong working dog my dogs when they are I, I my, all my dogs are led around me now by the way okay yeah. so they're all at my feet I've got all 12 dogs in my dogs all live indoors with me and they're all really nice and really chilled however they totally change when you put them in a harness um they become Derek one of my dogs is the Correct. quietest <laughs> Sorry. I've got Derek, Rodney, Denzel, and Marlene, which are my puppies. So if if you can figure out the um, if you can fi- figure out the theme, <laughs> so um, 
Derek at home is, do you know I mean, he's pathetically soft, very, do you know I mean, very, very, very sweet. Uh, but, do you know what I mean, but, but the minute that you put him in a harness, everything changes. And, do you know what I mean, he is, uh, they are true working dogs when, when you put them in harness. Yeah. But I also appreciate that internally they are still dogs and they still have innate dog drives and behaviours that need fulfilling. So whenever I deal with my own dogs or any of my clients' dogs, I always refer back to what do they do as dogs naturally? Because we may have enhanced traits, we may have selectively enhanced traits, but what do they do innately? Innately, they are dogs. Mm-hmm. That's it. That's the be all and end all. So whenever I look for answers to a degree, um, I look, I try and research and, and obviously um, sort of within my job role, I'm really lucky enough to be surrounded by um, loads of really good um, professionals that, that, I mean, that I work with. I've got a great nutritionist that I work with as well. So I'm really lucky that if I've got any questions, I can fire them um, her way. But for me, it, we should always revert back to what do they do naturally? Because that can give us so, do you know what I mean, so many answers yeah. into, into how to kind of keep our dogs happy and happy and healthy. No, it's brilliant. Michelle, I think the next one's you as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so when you've got your dogs on a raw food diet, how do we deal with treats? Because my treats for Poppy tend to be just shop bought ones because I wouldn't really yeah. know what else to feed her what do you do with your dogs yeah really really great question um so um my dogs actually get quite a lot of treats and I think one of the things that sometimes and I'm going to really generalize here but I think one of the things that we very much can overlook sometimes when we have working dogs just as I was saying is that need to be a dog so uh, with my dogs um what I try to do um quite often is for example, if they've been out uh, training the night before, so running on a rig, then the next day, what we will do is slow, quiet, calming activities. So things like enrichment, things like free work, things like chews. And whenever I go to any of the sled dog races, my foot is packed with chews because actually chewing is known to reduce the heart rate. It helps to calm dogs, drop dogs down. And when you've got dogs that are sort of sporting dogs, working dogs, high energy dogs, there's this really big misconception that everything that you do with them has to be high energy and high paced. And mm-hmm. the problem is, is that for very often for a lot of these dogs, they're also dropping pet dogs. They, they live at home with people and they need to have that healthy balance of energy but also learn to how come how to come down off of that that sort of energy as well. So, like I said, sporting dogs super super quick, super super mental. But again, at home, I've got twelve dogs led around me now that that all know how. I mean, all know how to chill out. So it's about getting that balance. And I use a lot of treats and I use a lot of natural chews in order to achieve that. And it's a really good way of also giving them something to do when you're at events as well. So if you've got events that are maybe two day events or week events or things like that we tend to or what I see a lot is uh sort of dogs that are a run and then they go back to the van and then they're walked out a bit and then they might be on a stake outline depending how many they are and they're there kind of sat there watching the world go by but what do we do to give them to decompress what do we do to get that arousal down in our high energy working dogs and giving them enrichment, giving them these chews and things to do is actually a really great way to kind of start to empty that that arousal bucket. So um, obviously, with the amount of dogs I've got, um, I do have some quite good trade accounts when it comes to chews. <laughs> <laughs> got to be you. honest. <laughs> but um, again, I really try to um, to offer that that variety. So natural dried ears, um, ears with fur on. Um, which is uh, I mean, deemed to be good for uh, sort of acting as, as a natural sort of dewormer as it as it goes through as well. Um, different proteins, so it might be uh, it, lamb's ears, rabbit's ears, um, pizzles. Um, all of those kind of uh, chews tend to be really great when it comes to rewards. So, for example, when I'm showing um, and um, I need treats, again, um, dehydrators. Oh my gosh, if you want to raw feed and you haven't got a dehydrator, seriously get one. It gets a little bit addictive after a while, if I'm being honest. But you can literally stick almost anything in a dehydrator. Yeah. So my dogs um, like liver, sweet potato, 
dehydrated bananas is a favorite at the oh, moment wow. um, <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah they love the the dehydrated um fruits off to google a um, dehydrator then. <laughs> <laughs> you'll hate me for this afterwards yeah. oh my god what have you <laughs> Um, interesting when I moved to the house that, that I'm at um, I'm one of on one side of the house there's um, a, a little fruit orchard and it's actually got eating apples and, and eating pears um, and the fruits uh, the trees were laden this year um, yeah. with with apples I mean so many I just didn't know what to do with and then oh you idiot so I called the apples sliced them into rings and dehyd- I mean, dehydrated them and again they were the dogs would eat them raw as well they I mean take the office take this the the uh, seeds out because too many of them um, can obviously cause dogs um, problems it's it's said but again they sometimes had them completely sort of naturally as a raw format but you can change the textures of lots of different foods as well through dehydrating giving them to uh, them raw again it can be uh, great you can grate apple um, so if you're doing certain things with them like um, very often if I go on a slow dog walk for example so if we've had a day of really busy activity and when I want to go out with them I want to, to again reduce that arousal bucket I do a lot of what's called um treat searches um and sniffaris and you can grate apple and um yeah and all sorts of things that that's do you know what I mean that's really really and it's those textures we can give so many different textures all with this all with the same food yeah. So um, when it comes to treats, like I said, look at dehydrating. There's loads of things that that you can that you can um, uh, I mean dehydrate. And when it comes to um, uh, sort of treats with regards to chews, again, there are so many natural treats out there now, and I think they get massively overlooked a lot of the time, and they can be really beneficial in um do you know I mean in, in environments where it's quite high energy like I said race sites where you've got lots of dogs barking and getting overexcited but also for that decompression time and chilling out at home as well we, we we need to get a good balance with high energy working dogs it's not about exhausting them it's about fulfilling needs and then combating that with calmer slower behaviors because otherwise if you keep feeding adrenaline into adrenaline you're just going to end up with a dog that's climbing the walls all the time yeah no that's that's really interesting actually I'm uh... Yeah. So quick question. Go for uh, it. it won't be a quick question. This I can see. This. <laughs> it might be a quick question, but it might be a long answer. <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. Um, so if I wanted to change pickle from kibble to raw, one, how would I go about? Yeah, well, I suppose. How would I go about that? And do I do that over a period? Although you did say earlier that I could just do it, I suppose. But would yeah, you mix so, a bit of both together? Yeah. So I've known do it both ways if I'm being honest um I've known people just go straight for the switch um but what they normally recommend if you're um looking at starting a raw diet um is to start on a on a single protein for a little while um and then after a sort of after so many days um add another protein in and the reason being is that it's just um, a good way that should your dog not tolerate a and protein you can you can find out what it is because obviously if you go in all guns blazing and start to give loads of different proteins and there's um a, a bit of an upset tummy from it you, it's it's much harder to figure out what's what's going on um you know people that um who kibble feed that have put um a little bit in each there was this really bizarre thing a um a, a, a while ago that was that was going around um and i certainly got told it if i'm being honest by a vet and when i questioned it I didn't get much of an answer but it was like oh my god you can't keep keep feed kibble and and, and raw together because like they digest at different rates um so? and I was like, yeah well this is what I was like well I'm pretty sure the meals I eat don't all digest at the same rate so I'm not too sure what's going on there so when we when we look at dogs um uh, I mean some of the fittest dogs in the world so you look at a lot of the dogs that run the Yukon Quest and the Iditarod which are a thousand mile sled dog races do you know I mean you have got athletes and they feed a combination of both because they need to get do you know what I mean to get the calorie count in and all the yeah. rest of it so um that there used to be that that sort of information going around and certainly on a personal again like I said I'm, I'm not a nutritionist um I do need to make that do you know what I mean very very clear but I've not seen anything and in fact um uh with some of the the, the talks that I've done with um, some of the leading um, nutritionists and, and um, specialists, 
um, they've said sort of the same thing. Do you know what? We'd rather actually see people just add a bit in even because it's that variety, yeah. even if they want to continue do, doing kibble. So I can only presume by statements like that that, um, that, that yeah, it's that, that, that there isn't an issue. So like I said, I've seen people do it two ways. I've seen people go, right, we're just going to stop and switch straight over. Um, and I've seen people kind of do do the do the, the gradual process with it really but what I would say is do start with a single protein because then if your dog does um not react well to something you can go I've got a friend whose dog can tolerate everything bar lamb right. so every time the dog eats lamb, do you know what I mean it just doesn't agree so she knows just to avoid lamb and the dog's absolutely fine with everything else like I said same same as us there isn't a one cap fits all solution um, to what dogs can can eat and what dogs can tolerate, same as same as humans. So slowly introduce your proteins in, and if there is an issue, take it back out. Maybe try it again later. And if after a few times you, you're kind of getting the same results, then then maybe it's just not a protein that that, that suits that should suit your particular dog. Yeah. yeah. No, that that's that's fascinating, and um, yeah, we could go on with that for ages. But we have some uh, questions from our listeners. Okay. We'd like to ask. So I don't know if you want to go first, Michelle. Yes, we do. This feeds in quite nicely, actually, to what we were just talking about. So we've got a question from um, from Canny Cross with Honey that says, "I feed raw and would love to know what's the best alternative or substitute when travelling." And you've just suggested, of course, that we can mix it up a little bit if it is too difficult. Um, so yeah, I mean, what 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 would you recommend there? What do you do personally? Yeah. So um, one of the things that I would say is that if you are kind of traveling abroad, there's normally a really good community of other people around. So I always like to try and liken it to our food where you would look for restaurants and you would look for places to eat. So with regards to alternatives, plan and it is, I mean, reach out to the to the canny cross, to the sled dog, to the sport, I mean, sports dog communities when you're going somewhere and ask if there's somewhere that you can stop off and maybe get some food. Yeah. Um, I know that there's um, uh, one of the um, uh, Malamute get togethers over here recently had a three day camp over. And I know that they reached out to a raw food company that actually delivered each day oh, wow. um, orders, I mean, orders to yeah. people. There's, there's a lot of people that feed that feed raw. And if you reach to people and go, we're going to be here at this time, can anybody maybe recommend where we can get some from? That might alleviate it. Um, I know that there are some um, air dried um, sort of alternatives to a degree, sort of raw air dried alternatives. Mine probably wouldn't eat that. The texture for them isn't sort of what they're used to. But again, it's um, it, I mean, it's each to their own. But as you but as you were saying, it, it doesn't mean that you have to kind of go, oh, my God, this is the only thing. It, do what do I mean, do what's right for you personally. Um, I for for my dogs, I always reach out to, to wherever I am and, and try and get um, try and get the community to to rally around there's raw feeders all over the world so i'm pretty sure if you reached out on the right pages and said we were here at this point can anybody help people would and um, that's actually a really good point isn't it that's, that's a good one we've got yeah. one from wayne who is uh wb coaching is that right michelle um, yes yes he yeah. did a, um, a podcast with us recently yeah. so it and i think you probably answered this but should you stick to the same type of raw food or mix it up yeah. So again, that's very much down to the um, individual dog and what they like. So um, one of my dogs, my one of my old guys, um, uh, he only likes a certain brand um, and he's very finicky. And if you give him anything else, he looks at you in absolute disgust and looks at you as if to say what you expect me to eat that. <laughs> um, yeah, he's very, very, very particular. Um, all the rest, um, in all honesty, um, I do mix it up quite a bit. Um, one of the things that to, to consider with the, the sort of different raw foods is um, also about the consistency of it. So different brands of raw foods are mixed through what's called plates, so mince and plates. And so some brands of raw food are very finely minced. So in the blocks, they're almost like a a sort of pate to a degree when you um when you put them in the bowl um mm. other brands tend to be um a lot more um chunky you can get brands where for example the 
the rabbit mince has got the hair mixed. I mean, they've, they've put the rabbit in, fur in as well. Um, and it, it's, I know. Sorry, I'm, <laughs> I'm just pulling the face too, I'm not too sure whether I'm a really good veg, a really good dog owner or a really r- rubbish vegetarian. If I'm <laughs> <laughs> when, <laughs> when, when I talk about these things, I remember being at a rally once and I was round feeding all my dogs and my hands were kind of covered because I was dishing it out. And somebody just caught, walked around the corner of the van and looked at me and went, you do really good for a veggie. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for <laughs> that. Um, so uh, for me, um, absolutely. I, I mean, I, I, I mean, I'm, I mix. Yeah, I, I mix it up. Um, I do mix it up, even between brands, just because that that texture and that consistency. Some of my dogs don't like maybe um, say the more finer. So I know to mix the brands up and for it to be a, a bit more chunky for them. If your dog likes all sorts, then then brilliant. Again, think that that variety and texture as well as variety of food yeah. can really bring interest to our to our dogs feeding. And as we know, we need to get the good nutrients in them to keep them on top of their game. They need yeah. that. They need that good the, yeah. that, that that good food. Well, let's just let's just move on to um, one from Adventures dogs unite that asks should we supplement anything extra um our raw foods such as vitamins or oils yeah so absolutely i think that you again i think that you can do i think the, i don't really want to advise on what supplements because that would be very specific to the dog yeah. personally um it depends again on the dog so um salmon oil um i do add in um green lip muscle one of the things that i always try to, to do is very often um and I'm going to sort of generalize here and I know this isn't the case for everybody but we tend to start to add things in when we think we're seeing issues with the dogs potentially or so as they're getting a little bit older and the one thing that that we should really be trying to focus on is prevention rather than when it's happened so sort of adding these things into our dogs um meals so um uh, I have a powder that I add in um it's a revive powder for when we're in training and it's for art it's for afterwards i also have some powders that i add into um um, any water afterwards i've got to say um again with regards when i raw with the raw feeding my dogs don't drink a massive amount because there's lots of there's lots of moisture in the water so when they cross the finish line they have a bit of water but they're not massively gulping down loads because they get they are consistently getting um i see uh, a lot of people uh sort of baiting dogs to try and get them to drink beforehand before before runs which when you're eating a more drier food mm. they can understand that because we as people know we're about to go for our for a run but our dogs don't go oh i need to take on some fluid right now because i <laughs> because i'm about to go and i think one of the, the things that i do really like about the raw is that they are consistently getting moisture they're consistently getting um uh do you know i mean that 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 sort of water content i remember um, a while ago, a, a customer, a client of mine actually um, changed his dog onto raw and he phoned me about three days later and went, is this right that he's just not drinking? <laughs> he's not drinking. And I was like, it's OK. And he was like, yeah, but he used to gulp down loads. And I like, no, he's not really drinking. And I said, yeah, yeah it's, it's quite quite normal because a lot of the, a lot of the sort of, uh, okay, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah a, a, a lot of the moisture is in there. So the one thing that I would say, sort of no matter what, you, what you're looking at with, with sort of supplements, number one, um, I think it's important to point out that the supplement industry is industry isn't regulated. Um, so when you are considering supplements, do your homework. Um, sort of uh, with regards to, for example, the salmon oil that that I buy, you need to try and make sure that it's ethically sourced first and foremost. Um, and second of all, um, we need to look at where it comes from, because actually, if if the salmon is is sourced out of polluted waters, then it has metallics in it and metallics can be toxic. Um, uh, my older my uh, sort of my dogs are on um, green lip muscle, but um, doing some some research into that, um, you can buy green lip muscle, but it's not the right parts of the green lip muscle. So you're you're spending money on something that actually isn't working so i think it's uh, it also has to have from my understanding um from the research that i've done and i'm more than happy to be sort of corrected by anybody um but it also has to have certain elements to it for it to to work properly in in the body so there has to be a certain sort of fat content in it for it to be sort of taken in so i think it's really important not to just jump on um, a bandwagon of putting things in because 
there's absolutely no point in setting fire to money. I mean, what does it need to work? How does it work? What are we trying to get it to do? Um, and I think that's kind of the most sort of key key element. And, and as I said, is it is it being ethically sourced as well? Um, because more than anything, we need to make sure that that's um, that's sort of all, all, always at the always at the forefront, really. No, I think that's um, yeah. I think that's a good good advice and good tips. Um, there's one from at Bear WGSD here. Um, I'd love to know about the food, which I think we've talked about, and pre-race prep. Is there anything different that you do? Or... Um, so when it comes to um, sort of race season, in as much pre, sort of just pre-race prep, um, not really um, because we're training a lot in any way. So it, it, the, the the one thing that I do. Um, uh, sort of with my dogs is I don't always feed my dogs at set intervals um I've got to be honest I'm, I don't feed at set regular times and that's <laughs> yeah th- there's a few reasons for that from a behavioral point of view I don't want dogs that start to expect to be fed at a certain time and then start to get to get rowdy over it um but also from a performance perspective we don't know when we're going to be racing. We don't know times. We don't know, is it going to be a night race? Is it going to be a morning race? And so what I don't want is dogs that start to kind of get freaked out by the fact that the feeding regime has changed. So I try to vary that so that I can tailor that um, to the dog's needs. The other thing that I would say from a a sort of performance um, aspect is um, I do actually, even at home, very often feed my dogs in the van. And I always try to get them to eat in the van. Uh, not always. I, I do vary it. But the reason that I continue to do that is because I also want eating in the van to become a natural um, sort of process for them as well. Um, yeah. I know some dogs that once they go away and they start to get into their crates and all the rest of it, they're kind of like, oh, God, what's going on here? All the excitement, sort of the excitement builds. So I try and keep my feeding routines as varied as possible so that variety is normal for them yeah. rather than them getting thrown out by hold on a minute well no 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 no. we don't normally eat here or we don't normally do this or we normally eat at this sort of time I do try to vary it the only thing that I would say potentially that I, I changed summer versus winter um is that I tend to go for a lot more of the fattier meats your red meats during working season because obviously they've got your higher fat content which is where dogs primarily source their uh, do you know what I mean their energy from and obviously during the summertime when it's extremely hot and my job is to plug in 10,000 fans and try and keep the dogs cool um, and obviously their energy levels are a lot more um, do you know I mean a lot more uh, sort of chilled um, so sort of we don't do nowhere near as much exercise then I might like might look to reduce the amount of um, higher sort of fatty proteins down um, and reduce that down so that we don't have huge weight gains sort of during the the summer, and then we're yeah. we're starting dogs that are, that are, that are, that are overweight um, for for training season. No, that's fun. That's really some really good points in there as well. It's been fascinating, actually. It's absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Emma, I think, you know, we, we, I'm we um, conscious of time and we, you know, it's been, we've got so much out of that. Well, I have. Um, and now I just need to look into it a lot more to see to see what I do. So I will let you know definitely um, what I do. But where can people find you if they've got questions or or anything? Um, you would- yeah, so you can find me through a couple of, um, a couple of pay, uh, sort of places. Um, my, so my kennel name has a Facebook page, which is Lost Trails, uh, Lost Trails Sled Dogs. Um, or um, if you wanted to contact me through my business page, um, my business um, website is um, simply speakdog.co.uk. That's brilliant. Thank you. I will put that in the show notes as well. No problem at all. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. No, thanks. It's been really lovely to talk to you, ladies. uh... (laughs) We got there in the end. We've been (laughs) good at times to do it. So thank you so much. Um, and I hope everyone has enjoyed and do ask us questions and I'm sure Emma will answer them as well if you do it on the Canny Cross um, conversations page yeah absolutely not a problem at all so don't forget to share subscribe and share with your friends and we'll see you on the next episode thank you to our sponsor Get Stronger Run Faster 5k It's great for canny crossers and runners to improve their 5k time and keep up with the dogs.
And if you get a moment, please leave us a review. We'll see you next time on Canny Cross Conversations. Thank you.